lactose intolerant. Oh, man. Here we go. So, I know. One, yeah. two. two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Will you come to prayer with me this morning? Embracing and loving God as we come together this day, let us look at those sacred cows that might be getting in the way of our lives. But let us be the doers of your good deeds, but allow us to remove or even push over those sacred cows that are getting in the way. Let us open our hearts on this day, but even more, let us open our minds so that we may be the receptors of the words that are about to be spoken. So I ask now that you touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this day, and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. Let them ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So if you were here last week, and even if you weren't, you can always go to our YouTube page and catch up. But we started a series titled Cow Tipping. And we began last week with learning how you go out to a cow pasture and tip cows for fun. Not really. But we did learn that you can move a cow, you can push a cow, you can really irritate a cow, but you really can't tip a cow because a cow doesn't sleep standing up. Now for a lot of us, that cow, as we talked about last week, represents the sacred cow or cows within your life. And that sacred cow is something that you've been trying for new, who knows how many years to tip over within your own life. You've been trying just to push that cow around to get it out of your life, to destroy everything and destroy that cow. As I said last week, we're not talking about the Angus cows or the Holstein cows or the Hefford cows or even those Jersey cows but we're talking about these particular sacred cows in our lives. And I think we determined last week that sacred cows are those things or things that are unreasonably immune to criticism, question, or change. You know that when you have one of those sacred cows in life, it becomes, don't talk about it. That's not something up for discussion. Don't even think about questioning me on that. These sacred cows are symbols that represent things within our lives that hold us back from really being healthy. And the things that we know that we need to be tipped over that need to be moved out of our lives. But for whatever reason, we hold on to them for dear life, as well as near and dear to our hearts many of the times. And most of all, they keep us from making God first in our lives. They keep us from really having that ability to worship God in every area of our lives. Ultimately, those sacred cows become those idols. These things that we place before the true God in our lives, and those idols can be anything. We know that they can be a person, a place, a thought, a need, that place alongside God, or even above God. But here's a little something about those sacred cows. They can't be tipped over or destroyed. And in our own strength, we simply just don't have the strength it takes sometimes to move that sacred cow to actually tip it over. But what's in our favor, those of us who know God and have Jesus in our hearts, we have that power within us. So let's jump into the tension of our heart and that herd of the cows and talk this morning about those cows that branch out with that big old dollar sign on the back side of them. And surely you can identify because bold in life, you see one of those big dollar signs, instead of wearing it on the front of their shirts like Superman, they wear it on their back side. These are those sacred cows in our finances or our stuffs. And I'm defining stuffs as our resources, our possessions, our money, all those things we have accumulated over time. One of the reasons why I put tension and dollar signs together is because oftentimes we think of that topic, how that topic of money is being taught in the church. 
our thoughts or our thought processes are not always a positive one. And I'm sure that we, especially when David gets up here on Sunday mornings to call for the offering, saying, oh, I'm guessing here goes one of those. Oh, no. Here it comes again, asking for money. Oh, now what? But I'm also sure that you wonder why we don't use those shiny gold plates that we had. They used to have them back in the day, the, the offering plates with the felt on the bottom of them. Well, if we were to get those instead of the baskets we use, it would cost us in the neighborhood of, well, let's just say, several thousands of dollars. They're not cheap. But when we talk about money inside the church, there's always that guilt factor, that shame, maybe that fear of the lightning bolt that's going to strike from up above if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I'm sure that for some of you brings the joy and to others it may be why you left your other church because only you felt that's all they talked about was money, money, money. But nonetheless, there are always all kinds of emotions and things about money, especially as it relates to the church. Now again, this is not a stewardship sermon because that'll come in the next several weeks when we go into stewardship month in October. But I think that there are times that we think that the congregation thinks that the pastor and the board are just reaching up to the sky, pulling down that magic checkbook, and there you have it, we're all paid. Now again, like I said, this isn't a stewardship sermon. My goal in the series is to hopefully to introduce God's perspective in the neighborhood of our finances and our stuff. Because our thinking pattern in the right direction that we need to think of having that right perspective. Now, work with me here for a moment because this might be a little bit difficult. I know that most of us don't carry cold cash and we all carry plastic in our pockets, but do me a favor and just pull an imaginary $20 bill out of your pocket and hold on to it for a moment. This is the thing that determines our emotions when it comes to giving money, especially when we're giving to the church all the perspectives with a lot of people thinking and operating under that mindset. Take that $20 bill and hold it in the air and this is saying that this is my money. And here it comes, here comes the board and the pastor who are out there to get their hands on that money. Now you may not buy that into that scenario but there is just a little bit of what that becomes true. This is somewhat how all things go. I'm the owner of the money, so when I give, I'm giving from my money. Or when we think the thought, when I give to the church, I'm giving to the church. Okay. Not so much to God and the denomination, but the church. Here's another fun one. There's just a lot more for me to lose than to gain when it comes to giving. And when I give to the church, it's a win for the church and just a loss for me. Because whenever I go to church, I always come out with less than what I walked in with. The more I give, the more I lose, I guess the pastor and the board all win. Not so. Those are the kinds of attitudes or myths that, we are, that shape our thoughts and pretty much our perspective when it comes to money and the church. More so, consequently, it shapes how we respond when those baskets are passed around on Sunday morning. And of course, that perspective or even those emotions shape our response. Now we heard in this morning's gospel lesson in Luke 16, where we heard Jesus teaching yet another parable. What is happening here is that Jesus is speaking with a small group of people that seem to love money. And Jesus is talking to his disciples, but surround the disciples were these Pharisees. And if you know from our past histories, the Pharisees were those religious leaders of the day who were those sacred cows. And we know that one of those happened to be something that they had, that their stuff was money. Because of their love for money, along with their possessions, they had a warped perspective about things. We know that parables that Jesus shared with us are the stories which teach us a spiritual truth, 
but by making earthly comparison. And in this case, in Luke, Luke, Jesus' goal with the teaching of this parable was to help the listeners, ultimately, even us here today, to see a comparison between the world's perspective and God's perspective on money and the rest of the stuff in our lives. So let me say this, it may be one of those uncomfortable things, like I mentioned last week, that some of these things during the series may hit you in the wrong direction. They may be a little uncomfortable to digest, but just roll with it for a moment. If there is something in you that makes you something less of a cheerful giver, it is because your perspective on money is giving. It's different than God's perspective. If we could begin to see money or stuff from God's perspective, it probably would be so much easier for us to do what God tells us to do. If you look through it through God's perspective, it really makes total sense, not only for us to be a cheerful giver, but to be in more of a reality, a generous giver. From God's perspective, everything belongs to God as well as through God's perspective, even if you are giving to the church, and even if you're not, or better said, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're giving to a church, but rather you're giving to the church to increase the work of God. Further on this, God's perspective is that we have a great deal to gain by learning how to be generous investors, and that we have nothing to lose but to gain everything. Now, what does Jesus have to say about this perspective? We heard one of the very few parables this morning in Luke where Jesus actually explains it to us. There are times that those parables aren't always explained. But rather, he just looked at this and he gave the parable. And as he turned away with the people scratching their heads, pretty much saying, what did he just say? What was that all about? Jesus somewhat has dropped this truth in the matter of people that have no idea of what's going on. And sometimes even the disciples who were in that proximity of Jesus would blurt out, hey Jesus, um, not quite getting that. Can you kind of explain that a little bit more clearer to us? But if you read it through each entire parable, we see Jesus taking a great deal of time explaining exactly what he's saying. We hear Jesus explaining that there is this wealthy man who has so much money that he doesn't want to deal with it and deal with the handling or the management of it. So he hires someone to handle his financial affairs and his finances because he didn't want to worry about the bills, his vendors, or the creditors. But one day after this guy was hired, he gets word that the financial manager is doing a crappy job of investing his money. So he calls the guy in somewhat like when we're called into the principal's office or the pastor's office. And he says, hey, buddy, you seem to be doing a crappy job. Close up the books, finish up what you're doing, and give it all back to me because you're fired. Now, having time to wrap his head around this while he was wrapping things up, it's, well, what shall I do? Since my master is making the management and my responsibilities go away, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. With all this, this money manager makes a mental note that he still has two things going in his favor, a little bit of time and a change of opportunity. So he has a little bit of time to now come up with a way to leverage his time and a window of opportunity so he won't be left out in the cold and then have a little something to get on with once the job is over and done with. And as we heard in part of the gospel reading in verse 4, it says, I have it. Here's a way to make sure that people will take me into their homes when I'm let go. So he summons his master's debtors and he begins to roll out his plan. And we heard it stayed, stated this way. Now the stu steward called to each of the landowner debtors that the steward said to the first, how much do you owe my employer? We heard the debtor reply, a hundred jars of oil. And the steward said, take your invoice, sit down, and quickly make it 50. He said to the others, too much, how much do you owe? And that answer was a hundred measures of wheat. And that was said to the steward that, take your invoice and make it 80. 
So picture yourself for a moment being in this crowd as Jesus is teaching this and we're hearing the story being told to us. I think we all would be a little bit confused. I mean, if you were in investments, it doesn't make for good practices. And I'm sure the disciples, again, were more than confused of what was going on here because they weren't quite sure what Jesus was teaching. But see how Jesus explains the story. He says, upon hearing this, the owner gave a devious worker credit for being enterprising. Why? Because the children of this world are more astute in dealing with their own kind than they are with the child of light. Jesus is making this blanket statement, pretty much saying, here's the deal, that people who live for the life today have nothing to do with life tomorrow or their current life. And a far shrewder or more frugal person when it comes to handling their resources becomes the son of light. And who were those sons of light? Well, they were the followers of Jesus. These were the people of the light. So what Jesus is saying is that the people of the world are on constant alert. They're looking for angels. They're looking for ways to survive. They're looking to use their wealth for the future in a current concurrence of their life. This is when Jesus began to explain the views of our stuff. And we should be taking note and learning a lesson from this unjust, unwise money manager. The key to all this is every person has a bit of time and a little bit of opportunity. And like this frugal money manager, we're supposed to figure it out, having a plan on how to leverage, having a little bit of a time and having that opportunity and having something to show for the future. Now, not just here in the present, but more importantly, in the life to come. So there will be people who will welcome you into their home. In other words, Jesus is telling us to use our friends for ourselves so when it's all gone, we'll be welcomed by them into that eternal dwelling. So when you die, you obviously are going to leave all your stuff, all your money, all your resources, your fancy cars, your fancy houses, you're all going to leave them behind. But if you use your resources in such a way to influence the people in the view of God, so that when you get to heaven, there will be people who will welcome you there, and as we've been told, that you, they will know you by your name, and they will use those resources as an influence of others, of having Jesus in their hearts. Everything we do is a tool. Now, from God's perspective, everything we have in our possession is considered a tool. And while having that responsibility to use those tools in a way that people use in their lives to have that impact of Christ, along with that advancement in their experiences with God. Each of us has been influenced by someone else's stuff as well. You see, God sees all the world's wealth and tools with great potential for those eternal consequences. So what do we do with all this? We need at some point to do an inventory of our resources. We need to do it and lift them up to God and pray, God, how can I use these things in your name? Maybe you have some things that you need to give away because you know you're never going to use them. Somewhat like spring and summer cleaning when we kind of go through the closets and get rid of things that we don't need. But basically, you might be one of those who are hoarders. Another one of those sacred cows in our lives. But stuff. And it's time to get them out of your life. It's time to start taking inventory of all of that stuff. And once we do that, we then need to say to God, how can we best use this stuff for the sake of eternity? How can I do, take and do all my stuff, which is actually yours, and put them into circulation for your well use? When I was a youth counselor back in the dark ages, and I won't go back how many years that was, there were a couple of individuals who were in their retirement years in my congregation. But they were the true treasures and the gifts of the church. This lovely couple never had children, but they adored the children and the youth within the church. They would chaperone the mission trips and have the kids over for summer barbecues and pool parties. You name it, they did everything for the younger generation. I remember one summer that they decided that they needed to expand their entertainment area both inside and out. Now, mind you, they lived in Beverly Hills. 
you imagine some of those Beverly Hills homes are not shoeboxes, but they needed to expand. They had a lovely game room that, that kind of led out to a huge backyard with a huge pool, all the trimmings that go with the pool, but they went to town and expanded this game room to almost a double the size. They added more furniture like couches, they put in a pool table, a handful of pinball machines and arcade games. They up, even upgraded the kitchenette to a bigger refrigerator, stocking with everything you can imagine that a kid likes. They became the annex for the youth to gather and meet. And I can't tell you how many young adults were brought to Jesus through their life, just by opening their home to these kids. There will be a time and one day that these kids will walk up to them in heaven and say, because of you, that all that you did, all that you gave back, you gave me that opportunity to get to know my faith and to get to know Christ, all because of their investment. Now, everyone sitting in this room, all of you, who are watching even online, we have that opportunity to take our stuff, to know what it's going to do and that to destroy even what we need to destroy to leave behind. We have that opportunity also to get it into circulation, all for God's purpose. Jesus said, if you recall, make friends for yourself now while you have a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity. A little bit of money so that they will welcome you into heaven, all because your leverage of your resources are for eternity. With all that said, some of us may be thinking here, well, I really don't have a lot of stuff. I really don't have a lot of money. Well, I want you to know, compared to the rest of the world, we probably are more wealthier than you think. Most of us own or rent a home or an apartment. Most of us have a car. Some of us have assets, but imagine what would happen if we looked at all of this as a tool for God's use. Imagine the impact that we would be as a church doing what Jesus is telling us to do and utilizing our tools out into the world. Now again, those tools aren't necessarily money. They could be our gifts, our talents, everything that comes within our life. What Jesus is telling us that through all this, that one day each of us will be appear before God and we will give an account of what we did with our resources and we will hear from Jesus and from this perspective that compared to these resources, no matter how much they had, that we still had very little. So again, everything is a tool. And the implication of this is that everything is a test. Because every day God is watching how we use our stuff and evaluating to see if we are using our stuff to advance in the name of God. Now, that may sound a little bit weird, but it's one of those things that we advance as we go and as we move our ways following God's way. Now, we get to the, I wanna to get to that point and finish that, Jesus finally finishes his story, and he's telling us all the things. Now, you remember that imaginary $20 bill I told you to hold at the beginning of the sermon? <coughs> Well, take it out again, because Jesus is telling us that it's not just a tool, that it's a test. And that I want you all to know that it's your trademark. And so Jesus tells all of us at the end of the parable that the subordinates can't have two superiors. Either they'll hate one and love the other, or they'll be attentive and despise the other. But at the end, he makes a very impacting statement. You can't worship both God and money. Everything we had or own as our trademark indicates to God to whom we really belong to. In other words, we can't serve God and we can't serve stuff at the same time. And where our hearts go, our money goes. And if your money is going towards everything except God's dominion or God's wishes, then where does our heart belong? Every time someone stands up here and talks about money, you know there's always gonna be that little bit of tension until we truly nail down where our heart is. Because every time that subject comes up, I just know and I see, I see the eyes, I see the faces, you know, that oh, we're, we're being slaves to all of this. Well, we're not. 
you know, and I and I, I can safely say in this congregation, at least in the six years I've been here, we we really don't talk about money, which is a good thing, other than other than offering time. I don't usually preach on money because I don't feel that it comes together with everything that we do. But when we extend ourselves, we need to think about the finances in our own lives. Think about this. I just have to have fill in the blank. I just have to have it or I'm going and I'm going to extend myself. I'm going way beyond what I can afford because I want it. Whatever it is, whatever you placed in that blank. You may be at the car dealership and you walk up to this car and say, oh man, I have to have that one. And that wasn't the one you were going in for. Something like, I know it's a little outside of what I budgeted and it's going to really put me in a pinch and I'm probably going to have to cut here and there. I'm probably not going to be able to give so much to God's stuff. But I just have to have it. Or it's that piece of plastic that you have in your wallet. You just have to have it. I can just use this one little piece of plastic and if that's the case, it means I can go and have the world. Well, if you haven't figured it out already, these are those sacred cows in our lives. It's a sacred cow because we make that our idol. Stuff you do and stuff that we want, sometimes it's stupid, sometimes it's not, but it's the trap of our sacred cow. Until you get that bill. All of a sudden you're looking at that bill and it's like, I don't remember paying that much for that. I mean, I did have the 45% off coupon. I thought I saved money. Oh, I can't remember even that I really spent that much money on that. <coughs> if you're living beyond your means, that's your sacred cow. If you're driving a car you can't afford, that's your sacred cow. If you are maxed out on your credit cards, well, you better kill a few of those cows because that's going to kill you. <laughs> but remember what we heard. You can't serve both God and stuff. <coughs> so what it really comes down to today is this. The stuff that God has put on loan to us is not only a tool, but it's a test. And we know that that test determines what our trademark is going to be. And if anything else, my perspective about my resources and how I handle the situation will determine the answer to this question. Who is God in my life? Is it God or is it stuff? Does God get your best or does God get your leftovers? Are you living for the here and now or are you living for eternity? And God tells us that God is looking at all of our resources and how we use them, which is an indication of whom we belong to. And it actually tells us where our heart is. Like I said, Jesus says, where your heart is, there's a treasure that will be there also. That's your trademark. What if we decided today to overextend ourselves for God's dominion? And not because we want blessings or not because we want to have prosperity, just simply because we want to keep God in our lives. We all have something common with each other. And with that just unset money manager, we have that commonality that Jesus was talking about us in the parable. Whether sitting in this room or watching online, we all have a little bit of time and a little bit of opportunity. Now take that $20 bill and put it into the air and, and like I said, and hold it and say that just like that unjust money manager, that every one of us has that opportunity to invest, to invest that time and that money and that talent. <coughs> Everything is a tool and a test. Everything is a trademark. But we will stand before God and we will give an accounting of what we did, a little bit of our time and a little bit of our opportunity. And that challenge is that we don't waste our time and that we don't waste our years and we don't waste our resources, but we let ourselves go with God's perspective. Remember, a little bit of time, a little bit of opportunity. Take an inventory, all of what God has given us. Whether you think it's a little bit or much, put it into play. All for God. A little bit of time, a little bit of opportunity. Blessings upon each of you this morning, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Amen.